Good afternoon. I'm Karen Ng, uh, CEO of CSMI. We are an engineering consulting firm that helps manufacturing facilities um, run more efficiently and productively. Um, and so I am thrilled to be here. The bad part is we're right after lunch, so I'm going to try and make sure that these hot guys are going to keep you engaged <laughs> so you stay awake um, and that there's coffee on the table as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have the three hot guys introduce themselves. Um, these guys look pretty smart out here, or these, these folks look smart out there. So I'll buzz you if you say what's in their profile, in, what's in your bio. So perhaps a quick synopsis, and then we'll shake it up a bit. And I'd like you to give a little known fact about yourself. Perhaps if you had one last meal to eat, what would you eat? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean O'Scanlon. My company is called Fortune Fish and Gourmet. We are located in Bensonville, right by the cargo entrance to O'Hare, which is a very important lo logistical um, point for us. We operate a fleet of 60 refrigerated vehicles and service restaurants, hotels, private clubs, and retail stores uh, across six states in the Midwest, from Detroit to St. Louis, from Indianapolis to Milwaukee, and all points in between. Uh, we started off as a seafood-only company, and uh, we run a full processing center uh, 24 hours a day where we're cutting fish that we source from all over the world uh, literally to order, uh, mainly for the white tablecloth restaurant trade, uh, but we also have about 30% of our business in retail, largely uh, due to our affiliation with Whole Foods. We service the entire central region for Whole Foods, which is 46 stores now, will be 50 plus stores by the end of the year and 60 by the end of next year. So they're really growing quickly and uh, we're happy to be with them as their partner for seafood. Um, two years ago, uh, we got into the gourmet food business, which was sort of a natural add-on for us. Um, we had a lot of chefs asking us for, hey, can you source this olive oil from Spain? Can you, can you find this sauce? Can you find this, uh, I don't know, chocolate even? And, and we uh, started getting into it, and then we purchased a company in a strategic acquisition. And that has been the fastest growing part of our business. Uh, it's now 25% of our sales in things like high-end olive oil, sea salt, cured meats, foie gras, chocolate, uh, cheeses, you name it. So it's a really, it was a great add-on for us. Uh, we have about 250 employees. Um, we run 24-7. Logistics is really our toughest challenge since we're flying in most of our product from all over the world. So when the weather is bad or you know, flights get full, um, it gets a little tricky. Uh, that's me. I guess my last meal, um, and I'm sure many of you have been there, but uh, uh, the best experience I've ever had in a restaurant is at one of our great customers called Alinea, which celebrated its 10th anniversary yesterday and, and I think really put Chicago on the map for wonderful restaurants. and. Uh, I don't know how many of you were at the James Beard Dinner uh, Awards on Monday night, but uh, again, Chicago has really become one of the greatest food cities in the world, and it's due to people like Grant Ackett's and his great restaurant, Alinea. So I would urge you all to try it if you have a chance. Thank you. Um, th my name is Jim Salama. Uh, I run a nonprofit called Family Farmed, and um, you know, watching that keynote presentation. Uh, really made me feel good, and Holly, my associate director, were sitting there. It's like, wow, all that stuff about sustainable and local and food with a story. We've been doing that for over a decade. This feels really good that you know, at an industry conference like this, you know, all the trends are things that you know we've been promoting, uh, promoting as an NGO for for quite a long time. Um, kind of started with uh, my previous career as a journalist and a owner of a natural living magazine, I was going to the Natural Products Expo, which this year had 70,000 attendees at Expo West in Anaheim. And, uh, you know, I was a bit really excited about this space, and, but realized there was no sustainable local food trade show. You know, there's a big national one that everybody goes to, but there wasn't one 
locally supporting family farmers and regional producers. So 11 years ago, Howard Tolman, who's now the CEO of 1871, at that time he owned Kendall College, he said, hey, Jim, you know, we have your trade show here. I'll give you the space. It wasn't even open yet, the, the Goose Island campus. Uh, we had 50 farmers. Uh, Whole Foods was our uh, founding sponsor, their VP of Purchasing. Uh, you know, gave a keynote along with Bob Scammon from Goodness Greenness and Paul Kahn from One Off Hospitality, who, you know, was pretty pretty prominent at those James Beard Awards. And uh, and you know what? It was a hit. We had 300 people, a lot of trade buyers, and realized just wow, there's some energy in this in this movement. So uh, the next year we added a consumer show. We went to Navy Pier. We lost 50 grand. My board's like, what are you crazy? Uh, that, this is a panel about challenges. But anyway, um, we figured it out. The city then gave us the Chicago Cultural Center uh, for a couple of years. It was great. Uh, you know, Mayor Daly came. We even had Patty Blagojevich before she was infamous. Uh, <laughs> and, and she told the story of how her daughter, who's on her lap, had food allergies. And when she started eating organic food, um, her allergies went away. And so, I mean, very symbolic of what this movement's about. That being said, you know, we kept growing, but we realized there's a lot of farms and budding food entrepreneurs who uh, really needed to grow but didn't have access to capital because, you know, it's such a small space, and at that point, very little capital was interested or understood anything about it. So we, we lucked out. Linda Dara from, at the time, Booth School of Business at University of Chicago had a food conference. I spoke at it. Uh, she said, well, Jim, we're not going to do this food conference again next year, but you should do it, and I'll do it with you. So Booth partnered with us. We did our first Good Food Financing and Innovation Conference six years ago. It was great. We had a lot of people. The deals were not really ready for investing. But the next year, an angel group came out. Um, it's Low Fig, the Sustainable Local Food Angel Group, uh, debuted. And then slowly but surely, that financing conference has grown. Now, uh, there's also the Angel Food Network. Brian Smith, who's here who, uh, uh, with Freeborn, he's created that. Uh, there's probably 15 or 20 private equity and VCs. Many of them are in the, in the room. So this, this space has really grown. The, the interest in deals is tremendous. And the deals are getting more sophisticated. Um, and you know, we've done about 12, we've helped farms and food businesses get about 12 and a half million in deals. So uh, it's grown, but still we needed more. So we actually uh, last year launched the Good Food Business Accelerator at 1871. And so now we're doing deep dives with uh, a cohort of businesses and uh, they're just graduating and it's a great place to be. And as far as a meal, uh, you know, it'd be around my fire pit with some lobster from this guy and some amazing sustainable wild-caught salmon from this guy and some food from the farmer's market. I always love to hear about lobster. <laughs> I'm Dan Zawacki, and uh, I am the founder of Lobstergram. And uh, I, I started way back in 87 when there, there was no Internet. And um, I had a real job at the time. I worked at Honeywell. And I needed gifts. I needed unique gifts for my clients. And I was one of the kids. I always loved lobster. I said, so hey, I'm going to give people lobster. Well, there was nobody out there that I could find that would deliver live lobsters. So I took it upon myself to find a, a wholesaler in Maine and ship some lobsters to me. And at the time, I was working in uh, Peoria, Illinois, the lobster capital of the world. <laughs> and. Uh, and no one told me that you couldn't do this. So I put my, uh, all these lobsters in the trunk of my car, and I drove around all my clients. And I literally, I put them in a, a plastic bag with a bow, a little bow, and a little card saying thank you, and of course some butter. And people, they just loved it. And uh, one of my clients actually said, hey, said, Dan, this is awesome. You should start a company, and if you don't, my wife wants to. So I said, well, I'm working on it right now. Um, so anyways, I went home and I wrote a little business plan, which was a, more of a things to do list. And uh, it was like 80 things. And after a while, I said, wow, if I, if I do this, it, it really could work. And you know, this is uh, talking about challenges. Well, way back then, the challenges were, well, there was no internet, right? And uh, back then, there were really no food delivery companies. You had Omaha Steaks. You had Hickory Farms, um, you know, and uh, that was about it, really. 
So it was, the, the challenge was trying to, to do this, and of course, I was in Peoria, Illinois, so it made it a little harder. Um, but uh, you know, we, we managed to, uh, to grow, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, it's been 28 years. Uh, one of the, 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 we have really four concentrations that I, I, I think that really um, define lobster gram. And is that we're a gift. We've always been a gift from when I first started. We're a gift and incentive. We're a B to C, probably about 80%. You know, you want to send a gift for the holidays. Uh, for everybody out there who forgot Mother's Day, my lobsters are great gifts. Um, <laughs> And we also do, I am a shameless promoter, I can't help it. Two more days. <laughs> and then we do some B2C as well. We also do some stuff on QVC. Um, but that's what we are, we're gifting an incentive. The other part of it is we're gourmet, right? We, we don't do pizzas, we don't do burgers and things. We're all great food that you'd find at the, the high-end restaurants. The other thing that I've learned is the guarantee, right? People are a little nervous about buying over the internet or through a call center. So we have 100% guarantee, and I think that's one of the things that have made us successful, as well as uh, the guidance. And that is something I learned very early on, is not everybody knows how to prepare a lobster, whether it's a lobster tail or alive, whether to prepare it, let alone get the meat out of it. So from the very beginning, we've always spent a lot of time with our cooking manuals and of course now we have how-to uh, videos. So I think those are the four things that we try and focus on. I mean, it's kind of a loaded question of what my last meal would be. <laughs> but I, I would say, go to my warehouse in Maine, have some lobsters with my family. And thank you for inviting me. Excellent. So what was very interesting is when we had our, our call to kind of come together and talk about the challenges of, of what we're facing, um, it, it just kind of shook loose of, of where we were going and, and what we were going to talk about. Then the next day we get Joe's presentation and as we we're going through it, everything that we had said is, was in his presentation. So I, I think that's fascinating that that is how it shook loose. I think it's amazing that we get to follow, the programming was done brilliantly so that we follow your presentation. Um, and you have the, the studies and the research, but then you have, oh, and an excellent researcher. <laughs> um, and then you have the real life experience behind this. The only thing I think is a little different is because these, these, this panel is, um, well on top of their game, very successful. You said these changes are going to happen in 10 years. The discussion was, it's happened. It's been happening for the past 10 years and continues to grow. So that is why they're successful, because they beat the pulse of what's going on. Um, so this is your validation to your data and your research and your studies. Um, so we're not going to go in the same order because we're crazy like that. What we're going to do is we're going to talk, um, um, the first thing that came out of our discussion is food safety. So Sean, you want to talk about that. We're going to do food safety in two categories. One is traceability and the other is sustainability. So let's talk traceability first. And you, you had discussed how that was a challenge for you. Sure. Um, it, it, because of the unique nature of our business, we sourced from 57 different countries last year. So traceability is a huge challenge. And um, we fortunately got ahead of that several years ago. Uh, because some of our big customers were really interested in, in having full traceability all the way back. Now, going forward, it's part of the, uh, I guess it was passed a couple years ago, the Food and Safety Modernization Act. We'll have full traceability. You know, the regulators are still trying to figure out exactly what that means. But um, at some point in time, it will be a requirement for everyone to trace the entire supply chain all the way back to, in our case, uh, a particular boat, a particular farm, or a particular FAO uh, region of the world, and, and follow that all the way through to everybody that touches it along the line. So it's, uh, it's a big challenge. There's, there's certainly IT challenges that we've worked through through the past couple of years um, to try to build our system. We feel fortunate because I think we're ahead of the game, but there are going to be some people in the industry that have to play catch up 
and are going to have to spend, I think, uh, a lot of resources on, on traceability going forward. Right, because that's a huge investment in your software package and to create the labels and some of your customers are asking for that too. But let's talk, um, Jim, you were talking about um, the produce and how that's a big deal with traceability. Do you want to sure. expand on that? Um, yeah, for us, actually one of our good partners, uh, Bob Skamen from Goodness Greenness, they're a you know, good size organic distributor in Chicago, employ about 120 people in Englewood. He's been a you know sponsor and supporter of our show every year. And uh, he's like, you know, one of our problems with local produce is that it doesn't always hold up well. You know, the stuff from California coming from a, you know, 1,000 or a 5,000 or a 10,000 acre operation, you know, they've got systems, they've got a whole food safety team, uh, you know, their packing is perfect, it's always consistent, and they take the field heat out of it immediately, and uh, it arrives at us, and it's got a long shelf life. And that doesn't always happen with local farmers. So we actually created a, a whole program called Wholesale Success. It's a training program for small farmers that, um, you know, the USDA has given us over a million dollars to train, you know, 8,000 farmers in 35 states, uh, and a big part of it is also food safety. And so we work with them on best practices in food safety, and ultimately, because of FSMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, you know, uh, that traceability is going to be a key component, so you have to have labels on your boxes, not necessarily your farm and your SKU and, you know, uh, or sorry, PLU number and everything else, but also, you know, if you're a mid-sized farm or a large farm, what field does it come through? So working with these farmers has actually been grateful. Uh, there's been a lot of gratitude coming from them because they needed to learn these things. And now if you want to sell to Chipotle or Whole Foods or Compass Group or any of the other big buyers out there, if you're not food safety certified, you're not going to be able to get on their shelves. And so we actually create a food safety system online where they create a food safety plan and with the plan, then they're able to go to a food safety certifier who scores the plan and then goes out to their farm, makes sure that they do what they say they're doing, and then they get food safety certified. But without that plan, they weren't able to do that. So actually, it's been really gratifying work, and I think it's, it's helped a lot of farmers being able to scale up and get to that next level, because without it, they're, not, they're going to be losing markets. Well, we, do you feel a little neglected we're not talking lobsters? <laughs> it always comes back to lobster. <laughs> Um, so let's go to sustainability as, as part of a food safety um, concern and challenge. Um, so we'll start with you, Dan, and talk about how you were so ahead of the, the game with the word sustainable. Well, it's interesting because before the word sustainable was really out there, lobsters uh, have always been a, a sustainable uh, species um, in terms of with the lobstermen and the catch. And the simple reason is that the, the lobster fishing industry has been around for you know hundreds of years, and the unique feature is that if if you're someone's grandfather, uh, then you would give this territory of the ocean, and they're very protective of it, uh, to your sons uh, and now daughters even, um, and and so uh, they learned early on uh, the that if you caught every lobster out there, big ones, small ones, whatever they were, that sooner or later they would all be fished out and then you would be ruining your child's livelihood. So by necessity, the, the lobster fishermen um, early on came up with uh, different size limits. So if a lobster was too small, you would allow that lobster, you couldn't catch it. And if you did catch it in your trap, you'd throw it back. Um, in, and vice versa, in Maine, uh, if lobsters are over a certain size, is around five pounds, uh, then they know that those are the lobsters that um, have produced the most offspring, and so you you cannot catch those. Um, and the other interesting thing that I that I know that if uh, a lobster man or woman, I'll say, uh, catches a a pregnant lobster, which has the eggs. Um, under them, uh, they will take a little V-notch, it's just a, like a little tool, and cut a little notch in their tail, and it, it doesn't hurt them, and then they'll throw that back. And that way they know that if that lobster is caught next year or the year after, 
uh, that that fisher person will then throw that back, knowing that it was previously caught and was a egg producing. So it, there's a lot of things that um, the industry has done, and of course the government, you know, they get involved too, um, and and they've had the official size limits and things, and you know, I think that's that's helped out for the sustainability of of what we do. Did you want to talk a little bit about seafood and NGOs? Sure. Yeah, it's, seafood sustainability is, is very important. It's very important to our customers, but more importantly, it's important to us because the last thing we want is to have the oceans fished out. Um, so we are in, very strongly in favor of good management of our wild capture fisheries. And uh, if you look at the United States, we actually are a, a role model for the world on how to manage your fisheries. Um, that's not necessarily true for the rest of the world, unfortunately. But um, if you look at it in a, in a global picture, basically the wild capture fisheries are being harvested and, and managed at uh, a, almost a maximum capacity at this time. So in order for the category to grow, we have to look more and more to aquaculture. And that is uh, the largest sector, uh, fastest growing sector of our business. When I started in seafood uh, 23 years ago, uh, we were selling about 20% of the entire product mix was, was farm seafood. Now it's over 50% and it's going to go higher and higher and higher. And we think that's a really good thing because aquaculture can be managed, can be managed right. Um, you know, Technologically speaking, we're having more and more advances that allow for faster growing fish, uh, for tweaking the food, uh, feed uh, to make it better, more nutritious. Uh, we are in big favor of that. Um, not, to, not to say that wild capture isn't bad. We love the wild fisheries as well. But for the future, fish farming is where it's at. And, and so sustainability in aquaculture really comes down to um, where is it grown? Um, how many pounds of fish goes into the feed to produce one pound of fish coming out? So that's a really big issue, and it's becoming lower and lower and lower. Again, all good for the sustainability message going forward. And, uh, you know, we feel like in, in, in the seafood world, we are really on our way. At, at Fortune, we've um, done a, for six or seven years now, uh, what we call our sustainability initiative, and we will find a smaller, maybe underutilized species that we sell. And we will highlight that for a period of um, three months. And we, we partner with the Shedd Aquarium, who serves as our uh, environmental um, you, you know, certifier. We'll say, yes, this is an underutilized species. Uh, then we go out and we work with a charity involved, uh, maybe a freshwater, uh, clean water charity that somehow is connected to this fishery. And then we'll promote it, and we donate back a certain amount of our sales dollars to that charity uh, with the blessing of the Shedd Aquarium. And we've seen sales of those items during that period, you know, triple or quadruple, and then they generally stay there. So our point is we're getting the message out to our customers. They're accepting the product, and that's continuing to build our sustainability message and goals. Perfect. So, so you're seeing that the food safety has become a big issue just uh, based on the market, based on how the world is evolving. Um, let's switch it over to a little bit on the consumer side. So we're talking about how we have a more conscientious food environment that's going on. You, you, everyone wants to see the labels and, and things like that. Did you want to talk a little bit about um, the transparency that's going on? Sure. Well, you know, and Fortune's a partner with Whole, Fish, uh, with Whole Foods. I think they've really led the way in this. Uh, you know, when you look at their seafood labeling, you know, they actually created uh, the Global Animal Partnership to develop a five-step system to certify uh, meat production. And so now when you go to a, one of their stores, you know, okay, if it's step one, you know, it's good. But if it's step five, you know, it spends its life on pasture and is processed on the farm, you know, and everything in between. Uh, 
uh, you know, say they really launched the organic movement by providing, not launching it, but took it to the next level by providing, you know, a very significant marketplace for organic products when, you know, at that prior to that, you know, it was health food stores, kind of in the back of the health food stores after walking through aisles and aisle, aisles of vitamin supplements. Uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, by providing a beautiful place for consumers to shop, uh, and then bringing in that transparency, you know, non-GMO, another thing, non-GMO five years ago did not exist. Now it is a $10 billion industry. I mean, that says something about what consumers want. Same thing with gluten-free. You know, it was minimal five years ago, and, uh, you know, now you see Enjoy Life Foods doing a very big exit selling to Kraft because, you know, they were early in this space, and people want to know what's in their food because maybe their food, their, you know, stomachs are more sensitive, or they want that food with a story. They want that connection with a family farmer. Uh, so, you know, for us, it, it's obviously it's been an awesome thing. And seeing the su supply chain respond to it uh, has also been really important. A lot of what we do is local food and, you know, work with local sustainable farmers. You know, and there's businesses now like Andrew Lutze and, and his, his food hub, Local Foods, that's aggregating produce from local farmers and meat from local ranchers and, you know, selling it to restaurants or selling it to, uh, you know, to other um, wholesale customers, you know, which has been an amazing thing. And, and quite honestly, businesses like Andrew's really didn't exist three, four, five years ago. You know, they're stepping into it now, adding a retail component. And again, they're selling food with a story, you know, which is humongous. We'll hear from Farm to Here also in another panel. And, you know, they're doing year-round uh, production of vegetables here in Chicago organically, which is awesome. So I wanted to know, well, I actually know the answer because you told me, but the difference between um, 10 years ago, what was in your catalog, to what's going on now. You had a cool story about your chowder. Yeah, um, we, you know, we started out with just lobsters, and then we evolved into uh, lobster tails and steaks, and then people said, well, you know, we would want to add some chowders to it. And I remember, it was probably 15 so years ago, that when I sat down with the, the largest supplier of chowder uh, in Boston. Called chowder. Chowder, sorry. And lobster. Um, the ingredient list was crazy long. And, I mean, I'm not a very good speller as it is, but... There were words in there. I had no idea what they were, let alone how to spell them. So it, it, it's, if you can't spell it or pronounce it, it probably shouldn't be in your label. So we've focused uh, in the last couple of years with our uh, supplier to, uh, you know, be a clean label, right? I mean, chowder, right? Clams, butter, you know, a little cream, a little sp spices, right? Um, and it was, it's interesting to note that, you know, talking about, clean labels, you know, when I first started Lobstergram, you know, it was lobsters. That was it. Lobster. That was my clean label. So I, I like to take credit for being a pioneer in that. <laughs> so what another challenge that we had discussed was talking about how there's increased costs that's going, which was your point number one on, on your presentation. Um, we're, we want to talk about logistics and distribution. Um, I want to talk about how the difference between how we don't mind paying more or a fair price. That, that was kind of a real good topic of discussion that we had. Um, so why don't you talk about your logistics and the complications there? Because of so much of the uh, product that we sell has to be imported, obviously fuel cost is a huge factor. And so when fuel costs were historically high, all that does is add more and more to the cost of seafood. And it, it, it got to the point where it was so, it was so bad, uh, particularly in New England, where um, fishermen were just tying up because the amount of money it would cost to, you know, fuel up their boats and stock up their boats and go out and catch their catch, they couldn't make any money. So um, that's, that's a huge concern for us uh, because, you know, we rely on uh, in not only fuel to catch and, and process the, uh, the product, but to fly it here or truck it here. 
So um, we were happy to see fuel prices come down uh, recently, which has certainly been helpful. Um, but for me, beyond that, the other concern I have is, uh, is labor cost, uh, particularly labor cost at my customer's level. Uh, when we see these movements where uh, cities and states are setting $15 minimum wages or, or whatever they're talking about in Chicago, uh, my concern is what does that do to the creditworthiness of my customers? You know, restaurants, uh, particularly smaller restaurants, you know, they, they often struggle uh, financially. And when you throw on all these extra added costs and they can't necessarily pass that on to their customers in the form of higher prices, uh, we could see, you know, some, some devastating effects of these things on uh, our local restaurant community in particular. So those, those are some of the things I'm seeing out there that, uh, that concern me. What about, Jim, what about the, um, the smaller businesses and how that gets affected? Um, you know, I think that there is a push now to um, moderate what's considered to be the high prices in the sustainable local food arena, uh, and, it, and it can be done. And, and I think that some of the larger people are, are proving it. Uh, you know, whether it be Chipotle, where you know you can get you walk out of there for lunch under ten bucks, which is not substantially different than the same kind of lunch in just about anywhere else in the loop. But you know, it's coming from sustainable sources, not always local. But uh, you know, certainly their supply chain is very transparent and high quality, and uh, you know what you're getting there. And so, you know, I think that's that's you know. Chicago Public Schools, they're buying uh, a lot of local food from producers in Michigan, in Illinois, in Wisconsin. And two, because of their scale, they're able to work with the Groot Family Farms or a few producers in Michigan and, uh, you know, provide a big marketplace to them. But, uh, you know, amazing client for these producers, which then also allows them to expand and, you know, come into some of the other distributors in town. So, and I mean, just a couple of days ago, I was with Walter Robb, Whole Foods co-CEO in, in Detroit, you know, he's doing a lot of work with the Eastern Market there, which is trying to, you know, is not only a big kind of hub for food distribution, but also they're working for accessibility uh, in all parts of the uh, Detroit area, especially low-income areas that might not have supermarkets. Not only did Whole Foods create a supermarket there, but um, you know, they, he told me, hey, we're creating a, a new chain that's actually going to be lower price, focusing on accessibility. You know, we still want to work with uh, you know, as many local sustainable farmers as possible, but we're going to you know, figure out how to do it in a way that's more affordable for everybody. So I think the trends are to make it, you know, I mean, it's still going to be, you know, good food is still going to be probably more expensive than the stuff that you're, you know, getting at a conventional supermarket with no kind of attributes associated with it. But I think the marketplace is now driving it so that, you know, costs will be coming down a little bit in part because of, of efficiencies and in part just because there's so much demand for it. Perfect. Dan, what about the supply chain for you with regards to where you're shipping to, if you're limited, with regards to who you can ship to, um, and who, if it limits it? Yeah. Well, uh, about 10 years ago, we uh, built our warehouse in Maine, because that's where the lobsters are, right? Uh, and with, with fuel prices, um, we use UPS and FedEx, so we actually can deliver to pretty much any address in the country. Um, however, you know, shipping a product from Maine to, you know, let's say, even Chicago or California uh, is, you know, a lot more expensive. So we are really exploring on, uh, we have a small distribution center here of opening a bigger distribution center. As right now, we ship about maybe 5% of our products out of our Chicago facility, more specialized, uh, and 95% of them out of Maine. Um, do and we ship everything UPS next day in two-day air and we're looking at so if we build something in Chicago in, in the center of the country right we can use uh, ground shipping um, which is a 
lot less um, as an advantage. And of course, um, you know, then there's some other issues with that. But you know, that that's one of the the, the big things is the the costs of getting a product from for us. Um, it, it could be it's 25, 30 percent of your your product. So um, we if we feel obviously we can get the price down for getting it to the customer and and uh, giving them that giving them that difference uh, will increase our our market share. So before we open it up for some questions, I'm going to ask each of it. You guys have been really polite. We're going down the line, or maybe I strategically did that. We have um, such a good moderator. <laughs> um, perhaps you can give a piece of advice um, to somebody that perhaps wants to do what you do, um, or a little lessons learned, or a little nugget that we can all walk away with. You want me to switch it up a bit? You want me to start the other way? All right. You want to start off? Oh, wow. OK. Um, boy, a piece of advice that I will give other people trying to start out in the industry, food or whatever, is I always tell them, I say, don't give up. And I mean, it seems so simple, but I, I've known a lot of entrepreneurs over the years. And, you know, they may work on their idea or their project, whatever it might be, for six months, six years, whatever it is. And maybe that next day, maybe that next week is when, you know, the critical mass would be there, would be a business. And the tough thing is you just don't know when that is, but, you know, just don't give up. Excellent. Um, as far as this kind of good food space, and we define good food sustainable, local, humane, and fair. So. Um, as far as the space and advice, uh, it's booming and um, it's exciting. You know, to do what we're doing, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a whole lot more opportunity there to engage with us. Yes, we have, I think, uh, close to 150 advisors and mentors on our Good Food Business Accelerator. Uh, you know, a lot of investors are interested in this space and quite honestly, we'd love to engage with more. So I'm going to make the, the, the self-promotional plug at this point. If you're interested in this space, we'd love the conversation uh, because it, it is growing very quickly. And, uh, but we don't know everything, and we don't know most of you. And we'd love to know more of you and see if there's ways that we can engage together. I guess the only thing I would add to that um, would be uh, – if you get into this business, either as an operator, as a farmer, a producer, distributor, processor like myself, <clears throat> you can have great goals and great products, but you have to make money. You have to understand your costs. You have to manage your costs and, and make a profit. Otherwise, you could have these wonderful sustainability stories, local stories, and what have you, and be out of business. I have a good friend who said, uh, nobody ever went broke making a profit. And I think that's, that's the key thing to this business, is make money. I like that. Save the best for last. Do we have any questions from our illustrious audience here? Go ahead. I'll repeat the question after. This is how the format goes. You tell me the question, I repeat it, the answer. So she asked, who is regulating sustainability, and what does that really mean, and where is it, go and where is it going? Where are we going with it? Yeah. And don't abuse it. Well, I, I would say in our space, unfortunately, there are a lot of what I would call radical environmental uh, NGOs 
who get in and define sustainability according to their own goals, their own uh, concerns, and in many cases, it has nothing to do with the reality of the situation. So what we believe in is having, uh, you know, uh, objective, third-party, science-based analysis that says this is or is not a sustainable fishery. Uh, we are partners with a group called the, um, the um, MSC, which certifies sustainable uh, fisheries in different regions and in different species. And they are science-based, and they work with the producers and the consumers. And in general, if they say it's sustainable, you can believe it's sustainable. Uh, I would not believe a thing that Greenpeace says. You know, they're interested in raising money, okay? And that's where we run into problems because um, I, I think you're right. How do you define sustainable it is a key issue and it will be going forward. Uh, and for us, uh, I agree. I think that the key is having independent bodies to verify and certify things like sustainability or animal welf welfare standards uh, or others. I think some industries do, you know, organics done a really good job and it's a th almost a $40 billion industry for a good reason because you know exactly what you're getting with it. Uh, in other realms, it's not there or, uh, or it could be compromised because there are some, some systems that uh, might be not accurate or verifiable. Uh, I think this is a big growth opportunity in the next five to ten years because people are demanding transparency and accountability and with that comes systems to verify and they don't fully exist in in every industry category and uh, quite honestly I think consumers are really confused because <laughs> there are so many different ones and then in some cases there's nothing and so I think there's a big opportunity there. Well I think with uh, at least the, the lobster end of it you whatever whatever you're selling is you got to get those producers involved and in getting them to understand that you, you know you you need to do this you you got to do it not only for the the welfare of the planet but for also you know other your sons and daughters you know and and I I always look back at how the lobster men and women uh did it and they they basically did it because they knew it was right, and I think if more people get that, um, it's it's simple. Um, and as Sean uh, mentioned earlier about aquaculture, that is the key right there, and then that solves all the problems, right? Um, unfortunately, lobsters are cannibals, and no one has found a way to farm raise them yet. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's why the, I believe that sustainability is is so important for uh, that industry, uh, the lobster industry. But to me, it's simple, aquaculture and getting, you know, the producers behind it. Thanks. Probably take one or two more questions. Or we can, oh, go ahead. He asked if um, in, there was a misclassification of seafood and, how, yeah. and species. How would you go about yeah. rectifying that? That's interesting. Yeah, there was a lot of publicity about that. There, there's several elements to it. Um, there's a very, very small amount of fraud where, um, you know, bad players are, say, buying tilapia, which is a very inexpensive fish, and they're calling it grouper. There was a, um, a big case in Florida about that. You know, grouper is very popular in Florida, grouper sandwiches. And if you, you know, if you bred up a piece of tilapia, it could be very difficult to tell. And uh, there were several uh, players in Florida that were sued for that, and we, we would be in favor of that because we don't believe in misrepresenting our products in any way. Sometimes there's very interesting cultural issues where we will sell a, an item to a restaurant and uh, like um, uh, sable fish and the restaurant will call it butterfish because 
uh, in certain areas of the world, that's what they call it, or it's a, it's a cultural thing. Um, in many sushi restaurants, hopefully there's some sushi eaters here, you'll see an item called white tuna, uh, very popular. Um, the, there is no such thing as white tuna. It doesn't exist. It's escalar. Uh, but that's the tradition that the Japanese have always referred to it as white tuna. And every, anybody who knows anything, if you go to uh, a sushi restaurant and say, what is white tuna, they'll tell you it's escalar. But those are, that was a large part of that study's, you know, quote unquote fraudulent uh, occurrences were in sushi restaurants using the term white tuna. So I would say just be careful when you hear stories like that. And yes, it's obviously something we have to deal with. What about super white tuna? Uh, same thing. <laughs> Do we have one more question? You are so lucky. You're the last question on the panel. So you're I never met anyone who knew so much about lobster. <laughs> That's Im that is impressive. What? Well, so you're asking uh, with can, regards to the sustainability of lobsters? Uh, with, yeah. Throughout the supply chain, yeah. Lord. <laughs> I got to repeat that for that camera over there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can remember all that. Um, it's talking about how, by doing being sustainable, how everybody can remain profitable throughout the supply chain, and make sure that the ocean's still safe. Yeah. Um, well, there's a few questions there. One is that the the ocean temperature uh, is is rising, um, and that is the kind of a trigger for the lobsters when they're out in the deep water to start moving closer to shore where then they can get caught by the lobster men and women. Um, with that noted, unfortunately this has been a, a horrible, uh, and I'm sure Sean can attest, the season, the lobster season has not opened. It, historically it's been open by now and um, it, it just it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, lobster men and women out there that are missing out on that time frame when they're catching lobsters and, um, you know, selling their products. So that, that's going to hurt them, um, but it all kind of is based on the, the, the fluctuation of, of lobster, and it, it can vary almost day to day, really. Um, so if they're not catching as, as many, well, then the price is going to be um, higher to reflect that because you're only going to, you know, the thing about the lobster is you're only going to catch so many. It's not like cattle where you can go look out and say, oh, yeah, I got, you know, 10,000 head out there. It's going to, you know, I got X amount of inventory. You know, the lobster, it's, it's not that way. And I think maybe Sean could probably put some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would comment that what, what I've seen with my sort of wholesale guys that are selling to people like me in Maine and Canada is uh, they're starting to find new markets. The, the large, fastest growing market for lobster right now is China. Huge. So they've gotten good in finding new markets for their products. So, you know, these are good business people. And I think they will figure out a way to, um, you know, work through these issues. It's not a lot we can do to, to change the temperature of the ocean or... You know, frankly, 
one of the biggest issues with, with lobster and the, and the fact that there's been such an abundance is their biggest natural predator is cod. And when the cod stocks declined, they were able to thrive. And so you see this when um, either Mother Nature or the regulators, uh, you know, push one product over another, it, it has an effect throughout the chain. Um, wild striped bass started to decline in the mid-Atlantic and they basically made it illegal to catch or put in huge limits. Well, what happened after that is that they started to thrive and, and basically wiped out the crab industry in Chesapeake Bay. So um, it's a very tricky and delicate balance that has to be, to be brought. And again, you know, working with the scientists and um, NOAA, which is actually a wonderful, good organization that, that manages our fisheries in the U.S., we try to work through these problems, but it's tricky. I, I can't say anything other than that. Uh, just a, a side note there. For fresh lobster meat, uh, that would typically cost us 22 25 bucks a pound. I think last week was uh, at almost $50 a pound. Um, so, you know, that's just the nature of uh, the lobster business, just whoosh, up and down. With that, we'll close out. Thank you so much for engaging with us, and um, we thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists, Sean, Jim, and Dan. You guys did an awesome job. I think.